Hey guys, welcome. Um, so today we're going to talk about male reproduction. Okay, and we're really going to focus on three different things. We're going to focus on the testicles, sperm, and the path that sperm take as they leave the body. Okay, so um, the testicles are an organ located outside the body, and this is where sperm are created. And you might be wondering if this is an organ that's so important. I mean, think about it. This is the organ that is responsible for reproduction in males. If it's so important, why is it located outside the body where it's completely susceptible to injury and all that stuff? I mean, every other important organ in our body is protected underneath bone and tissue, like our brain, our heart, all that. Well, it's all about temperature, okay? Turns out that sperm are more efficiently stored about three degrees cooler than body temperature. They can be made at body temperature, but they're more efficiently and they stay healthier um, after they're made when it's a little bit cooler. Okay, so that's the whole reason why the testicles outside the body. And there's actually um, a thin layer of smooth muscle called the cremaster muscle that lies just underneath the surface of the, the skin. And what this does is this muscle can control how close the testicle lies um, relative to the body. If the temperature is too cold in the testicle, this muscle will contract. That pulls the testicle closer to the body so it can heat up. And then vice versa, if temperature is too hot, that muscle relaxes, increases the distance, or the, the increases how far away the testicle is from the body, and it cools um, that structure down, okay? So um, now if we were to look inside the testicle, let's do, this is obviously a um, lateral view of the, the testicle, and um, if we were to do kind of a sagittal section through it to see what's inside, you'll notice that there's an oval-shaped structure called the testes, okay? It's kind of located more towards the anterior and inferior side of the testicle, beach testicle. And um, this is the site where sperm are made, all right? So this is actually the site of spermatogenesis. Inside um, this, these testes, they're filled with these tiny little tubes called seminiferous tubules. Each seminiferous tubule is arranged in a little loop, which is called a lobule. And there's a bunch of these packed in these testes. Um, there's probably like 20 feet worth of seminiferous tubules packed in um, each testes, and this is where sperm are made. Okay? But it turns out that when these sperm are first produced, they're really kind of pathetic cells. They're definitely not ready to, to fertilize an egg. They're immature. They can't really swim yet. They're definitely not ready to, for fertilization to occur. So they need time to develop. And what happens is there's a slow kind of flow or current of fluid in that, inside these seminiferous tubules, which carry these immature sperm and gives them a chance to um, develop. These sperm are going to flow out of the seminiferous tubules and they're going to enter into this really kind of intricate maze of tubes called the reet testes. This is going to be located more on the um, superior side of the, the testes. And the, the sperm are going to flow all through this. This gives them a chance to continue to develop, learn how to swim, and um, so that they can ultimately fertilize the egg. Okay. After they flow through the reet testes, they're actually going to emerge from the testes and they're going to enter into another very twisted up long tube called the epididymis. Okay. Now I drew the, the seminiferous tubules and the reet testes in blue. Now this epididymis is going to be drawn in green. And um, the epididymis is going to emerge from the reet testes and it's going to be a coiled up tube that kind of passes along the posterior side of the testes and goes downwards or inferiorly um, all the way down underneath the testes on the back side, right? The epididymis has three different parts. It's got the head up top, the body, which goes behind the testes, and then the tail, which is at the bottom. Okay, it's a very coiled up tube. Now, it takes about three weeks for sperm to travel from the seminiferous tubules in blue all the way down to the tail of the epididymis, which is in green, okay? And um, during those three weeks, they've developed, right? And now, once they reach the tail of the epididymis, the sperm, um, they can swim, they are ready, they're fully mature, and they are ready to um, fertilize an egg, okay? Now, um, there's a lot of sperm that are being produced by the testicle each day. On average, each testicle produces 400 million sperm. That's a huge number. That's more sperm than there are people that live in the United States. So a really huge number of sperm are being produced. And in fact, there's about 250 million sperm in each ejaculate for the average male. You might be wondering why so many. Well, if you've got 250 million cells all looking for the same thing, which is the female egg, somebody's 
probably going to find it, right? So it's really like a numbers game. But what's interesting is that if there's more than about two to 300 million sperm per ejaculate, the chances of fertilization don't increase. So it kind of levels off after 250 million. But below 250 million, the chances of fertilization drop pretty fast. In fact, if a male produces less than 70 million sperm in an ejaculate, it's considered to be infertile. Like the chances of fertilization are just so low that it's unlikely to happen. Okay, so a lot of sperm are needed, um, but if it gets above 250 million, um, chances of fertilization don't really increase. Okay. Now, um, what I'm going to talk about is um, next we need to talk about the next tube. So when it's time for the sperm to leave the body during ejaculation, the um, smooth muscle inside the walls of the tail of the epididymis are gonna contract. This is where these mature sperm are housed. It's gonna propel them into the next section of the um, male reproductive system, which is called the vas deferens. The vas deferens is a thick, is a very muscular tube that leaves the testicle, goes into the abdominal cavity, okay? As it goes into the abdominal cavity, it actually wraps in front or anterior to the pubic bone goes up above and around the bladder and then it um, kind of uh, goes behind the bladder all right now this um, vas deferens is uh, made up of smooth muscle and peristalsis these very strong kind of rhythmic peristaltic waves of contraction that's what propels the sperm out of the testicle and ultimately outside of the body um, during ejaculation okay now when this vas deferens goes around behind the bladder, it's going to meet up with the, the secretion of one of the male accessory glands. The first one is called the seminal vesicle, which I've drawn in orange. The seminal vesicle is going to produce a yellowish fluid, which contains a lot of um, nutrients, which help to kind of like nourish the, the sperm. It also is going to contain um, some coagulation factors, which help hold the sperm inside the female womb. We'll talk about that next time with female reproduction. And then it also um, contains like a yellowish pigment, pigment which fluoresces under ultra ultraviolet light. That's why, you know, like the police, the FBI, they can detect the presence of sperm kind of in, after the fact in the location um, using UV light because that yellow pigment will fluoresce. Right? Now, um, so the sperm will meet up with the secretions from the seminal vesicle. Um, then the vas deferens goes right through this yellow structure, which is called the prostate. The prostate is another accessory gland, which is going to secrete um, more fluid. It's a, a whitish fluid, which contains a bunch of enzymes, which help to activate the sperm, activate them to swim, so that fertilization can occur um, later. Okay. After it emerges from the prostate, it's then going to meet up with um, a tube that connects it to the bulbo-urethral gland, which I've drawn in green. The bulbar urethral gland actually produces a secretion that um, is secreted before ejaculation occurs. And what this does is that this um, secretion helps to neutralize the acidic pH of the tubes that leave the body. And it lubricates those tubes so that the, ster the sperm and the, and the semen can exit um, freely. Right? So next, um, all of these secretions and the sperm are kind of urethra. Okay, the urethra is going to go underneath or inferior to the pubic bone and it's going to carry um, the sperm and the secretions from the accessory glands, now it's called semen, outside of um, the body. The urethra, as we'll learn in the urinary system, is also going to contain um, urine um, from the bladder during urination, but that happens at a completely different time. Okay. So now, we'll just finish drawing this. Obviously, the urethra is going to exit through the penis, and then that is the path that it takes to um, uh, leave the body. Now, we'll focus more on the specific function of the, the semen um, next time when we talk about the female reproductive system. It'll be a little bit clearer, better time to talk about that. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about is a vasectomy. So a vasectomy is a process in which a male... Um, voluntarily become sterile, right? This is when the vas deferens is cut or cauterized. And so um, a physician will go in there, I'll cut the vas deferens um, in the testicle, and this will prevent sperm from leaving the testicle, right? Sperm is still produced, they just can't leave. Now, um, after about three months, uh, after sperm have been housed in the tail of the epididymis, they just get reabsorbed. So after a vasectomy, the sperm are produced, they just can't, um, they just can't leave, okay?
The testicle also has some really important endocrine functions, um, which are worth talking about. Um, inside the seminiferous tube, or inside the testes, around the seminiferous tubules, you have a bunch of specialized cells called Leydig cells. What these guys do is they produce testosterone. Um, so testosterone is produced in the testicle, and um, testosterone is a really powerful and important hormone. Okay, so it gets secreted in very high quantities um, um, during puberty, right? And then continues to be secreted um, throughout the male's adult life. It stimulates the growth of skeletal muscles, of, of, of skeletal of, of the bones. It um, has some really important behavioral changes or causes some behavioral changes, increases confidence, increases aggression, increases territorial behaviors. Um, during puberty, it's going to stimulate the rapid growth of the male organs, the, the testicle, the penis, the prostate, the, the seminal vesicle. Um, so it has a really powerful and a kind of important um, hormone. Now, um, steroids are effectively just synthetic testosterone. And um, sometimes steroids can be abused by athletes trying to get an edge because they'll take these synthetic uh, tes you know, testosterone steroids, which will raise their testosterone levels to like six to seven times what it normally would be. Now, this will cause the growth of skeletal muscles, right, and also increase like confidence and aggression. But the production of testosterone um, occurs or, or is con controlled by a negative feedback loop in the body. Okay, so the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland in the brain, they monitor testosterone levels and they control how much testosterone the testicles produce. Well, if someone's on steroids, right, their testosterone levels are through the roof. That's going to shut down the production of testosterone by the testicles. This causes the testicles to atrophy, to get smaller. And it turns out that the size of the testicles, as you can imagine, has a direct correlation on the production production. Of, um, or a loose correlation on the production of um, testosterone. So as the testicles atrophy, they produce less and less testosterone. And if someone's really on steroids, those testicles are going to shut down their production of testosterone altogether. Now, if someone gets off of testosterone after you know a couple of months, that um, the late egg cells and the testicles kind of reboot themselves. But if someone is a chronic user of steroids, they could shut down their testicles' ability to produce testosterone forever. And this is going to um, be a huge problem because that person is going to have to be on hormone replacement therapy. Otherwise, they'll start developing female sexual characteristics, which is um, probably not ideal. Okay, so that is the deal um, with that. Now, the last thing I wanted to kind of talk about is uh, the blood supply to the testicle. So um, the gonadal artery that feeds blood to the testicle, um, this kind of presents a unique challenge because the blood coming into the testicle is very warm, it's body temperature, but it needs to cool down. So the way that the body does this is it's going to have the cooler venous blood that's returning to the body. It wraps around that gonadal artery in this net-like arrangement, and that helps to cool down the arterial blood as it enters the testicle. And on the way back up, that cold venous blood gets warmed back up on the way to the body. So it's kind of a nice way of providing the testicle with a cooler um, blood. Okay, and that's about it. Okay, thank you for listening.